on World News Tonight. Twitter crashes. Twitter crashed repeatedly during a highly anticipated live between Elon Musk and Ron DeSantis, who launched his presidential campaign for 2024. Sydney ablaze. Walls collapsed at a Sydney building hit by a massive blaze despite measures taken by firefighters. Ship refloated. Suez Canal Authority successfully refloats briefly stranded ship after hours of digging. Passing of a legend. Queen of rock and roll Tina Turner passes away at 83 with fans being tribute worldwide. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you are watching World News. Tonight we lead from the United States as Ron DeSantis launched a White House bid. Twitter crashed repeatedly during a highly anticipated live audio chat between Elon Musk, Twitter's owner, and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, hampering the politician's announcement that he's running for the Republican presidential nomination. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis officially joined the race for the U.S. presidency on Wednesday. He released his first campaign video setting up a direct confrontation in the Republican contest with his one-time ally, former President Donald Trump. And I'm running for president to lead our great American comeback. However, the rest of the launch did not go smoothly. Twitter crashed repeatedly during a highly anticipated live audio chat between DeSantis and Twitter CEO Elon Musk. Put his money where his mouth is. Upset the narrative. Upset the narrative. Control. Control. The audio cut out and some users were dropped. At one point, it appeared that over half a million people tried to join. Elon Musk blamed the problems on the number of listeners on Twitter spaces. Right, we're just uh, reallocating more uh, server capability uh, to be able to handle the load here. It's uh, really going, going crazy. The same service handled 3 million listeners for Musk's interview with the BBC last month. Twitter outages have become more common under Musk's ownership, as he laid off thousands of staff, including software engineers. Former President Donald Trump was gleeful over DeSantis' shaky Twitter launch, posting on his Truth social account, it was a disaster. In the months leading up to his presidential bid, DeSantis has toured the country, visiting states such as Iowa and New Hampshire that will hold early nominating contests, boasting of his record as Florida's governor. We will never ever surrender to the woke mob. Our state is where woke goes to die. Which includes severely restricting abortions in the state and making it easier for residents to carry concealed weapons. He also kept up a protracted battle with Disney over its criticism of laws that banned the teaching of gender identity concepts in public schools. But DeSantis' decision to wait to enter the race may have cost him in the polls, as Trump has had ample time and space to attack DeSantis, while some allies may have grown frustrated waiting for the Florida governor to step into the ring. Besides DeSantis and Trump, other declared Republican candidates include Nikki Haley, former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, and Tim Scott, a U.S. Senator from South Carolina. Still in the U.S., even as possible default looms, there is still no breakthrough in talks between the White House and the top Republican negotiators regarding the debt ceiling. With only eight days before the U.S. government could face an unprecedented default, negotiators for Democratic President Joe Biden and top congressional Republican Kevin McCarthy reconvened for another round of discussions at the White House on Wednesday, but failed to secure a deal on the debt ceiling. McCarthy said they moved in a positive direction, but said they're still far apart. You have to spend less than you spent last year. That's not that difficult to do. They have increased spending with the Democrats in the majority on discretionary spending by more than 33 percent. No household's been able to afford to do that. We can find waste. We can eliminate that. The U.S. Congress faces a June 1st deadline to either raise or suspend the debt ceiling in order to avoid a catastrophic default. Republicans led by McCarthy have been insisting on spending cuts in exchange for raising the debt limit. They say they'll not accept a deal unless it results in the government spending less money than it did in the last fiscal year and are pushing for cuts to 2022 levels. But the White House says the Republicans are risking a devastating default as they demand extreme spending cuts that would hurt millions of Americans. Meanwhile, at a Wall Street Journal event on Wednesday local time, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen expressed concerns and said it's highly likely the U.S. would run out of resources 
to meet all the government's obligations in early June, and possibly as early as June 1st. So we are seeing some stress already in Treasury markets, and I think that that uh, should be a reminder of the importance of uh, reaching a timely agreement. With the growing possibility of a default, U.S. stocks fell on Wednesday, with the Dow Jones ending the day down by around 250 points. A fire has engulfed and completely gutted a multi-story building in central Sydney, casting a huge pall of dark smoke across the city. More than 100 firefighters battled the blaze after the building was evacuated. The 70-story building's roof collapsed, then the floors as thousands watched on. Helicopter footage showed the Surrey Hills factory well lit between Randall Street and Randall Lane near Central Station in Surrey Hills. Some 25 fire trucks and more than 100 firefighters are at the building working to contain the blaze. No casualties have been reported yet. Fire crews were spraying the building from the street and from area ladders. Neighboring apartments in the densely populated area were also being doused with water to protect them. Footage showed walls collapsing and vehicles on fire nearby. Neighboring streets and laneways have been closed as dark plumes of smoke was visible across the central city. Locals were urged to stay away from the area and listen to advice from police and firefighters. A ship that was grounded in the Suez Canal has been refloated. Tugboats have been working to refloat the bulk carrier named Shanghai Tong 23. The Suez Canal Authority did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Two years ago, the Suez Canal, one of the busiest waterways in the world, was impassable for almost a week after a giant container ship became stuck. According to the Marine Traffic Ship Tracker, the ship, which sails under the Hong Kong flag, had been not under command near the southern end of the canal, positioned at an angle next to the canal's eastern side. The tracker also showed that there were three Egyptian tugboats surrounding the ship. The Ever Given, one of the largest container ships in the world, blocked the canal six days in 2021, disrupting global trade. The Ever Given, one of the largest container ships in the world, the ship operated by Taiwanese firm Ever Given Marine, causing a backlog of hundreds of vessels trying to use the waterway last year, an oil tanker which was briefly stranded in the canal after a fault with its rudder, was refloated by tugboats. In March of this year, the breakdown of the container ship in the canal caused minor delays. South Korea's team of 21 experts sent to Japan continues expecting the crippled Fukushima nuclear power plant to access whether the contaminated water is safe enough to be released into the Pacific Ocean. Wrapping up their second day of inspections, the South Korean experts said that they focused on the emergency valve to shut down the discharge. South Korea's inspection team sent to Japan is on its second day of on-site inspections of the Fukushima power plant. They visited the chemical lab that analyzes nuclides, the plant's tritium dilution system and the facility responsible for actually releasing the treated water. After their observation addressing the media, the chairman of the inspection team Yuguki said they had focused on whether the shutoff valve was in place adding that the valves are there to shut off the system if there is a problem with the contaminated water after going through the ELPS process but before being diluted. The focus of the inspection was on where the emergency valve is and whether it's fully functional. But still, the chairman said additional inspections have to be done for them to come to a conclusion. It's still a bit too early for a conclusion. We did check the location of the valve with our own eyes but we still have to check how the valve works and its capacity. He also said other items included the tools to figure out the nuclear concentration level for each radioactive material as well as the dilution system's capacities. Wednesday's inspection lasted 30 minutes less than Tuesday's and according to the chairman, everything on the day's agenda went according to plan. Separately, in a parliamentary session on Wednesday, Seoul's Foreign Minister Park Jin dismissed concerns that South Korea is only giving Japan reasons for the discharge of contaminated water by sending its own team of experts to the power plant. The inspection team is not Japan's sidekick. Of course, the IAEA is conducting inspections, but our team of experts is also there to closely examine the facilities for themselves and let the public know what they found. Park also reaffirmed that the government will not lift its ban on seafood imports from Fukushima unless public concerns are eased. 
On Thursday, the last day of their mission, the 21-member inspection team will hold an in-depth discussion with relevant Japanese officials based on the information gathered from the on-site inspections before returning back to Seoul the following day. We're going into a short commercial break now. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Now, Tina Turner, the dynamic rock and soul singer who rose from humble beginnings and overcame a notoriously abusive marriage to become one of the most popular female artists of all time, has died at the age of 83. Tina Turner, sometimes nicknamed the Queen of Rock and Roll, died on Wednesday at the age of 83. A representative said the legendary singer died peacefully after a long illness in her home in Kusnacht near Zurich, Switzerland. Known for her chart-topping song, What's Love Got to Do With It?, in which she called love a second-hand emotion, Turner epitomized 1980s style and often strutted red carpets with her spiky blonde hair, a short skirt, and stiletto heels. In an interview from 1996, Turner was asked how she kept fit. Just to get it out of the way, I'll just tell you that everyone is now going to gym, gyms and exercising and carrying on, and it is said that it's good for your health, all of this yelling. And, the, and I've been singing and traveling and dancing for 35 years, so I think that my work has taken care of all of my aerobic classics. So <laughs> that's the answer to that one, all right? Turner won six of her eight Grammy Awards in the 1980s. Years later, in 2008, Turner and Beyonce performed together at the Grammys. Tina rocks. She is the absolute best. It's something that I've been wanting to do for years, and it actually happened. It's amazing when those moments come to life. Ike Turner was the person to discover Tina at the age 17 when she grabbed the mic at a St. Louis club in 1957. He gave her the stage name Tina Turner before the two married in Mexico. The superstar left Ike Turner in 1976 and was forthcoming about the abuse she suffered from her former husband during their marital and musical partnership in the 1960s and 1970s. Their divorce was finalized in 1978. Private Dancer from 1984 went on to become Turner's biggest album, the capstone of a career that saw her sell more than 200 million records in total. In 1985, Turner met German music executive Erwin Bach. Years later, she married him, relinquishing her U.S. citizenship and becoming a citizen of Switzerland. She battled a number of health problems after retiring and then faced family tragedies with the death of two sons. Tina Turner is survived by Bach and two sons of Ike's that she adopted. Since recent fightings between Israel and Palestinians, mental health experts say that children in Gaza are experiencing lack of sleep, anxiety and a tendency to cling to their parents, with healing almost impossible as the causes remain unchanged. Whenever a door slams, 10-year-old Bissan Al-Mansi mistakes it for a bomb. Her house in central Gaza was among several that were damaged or destroyed by Israeli strikes during the latest round of fighting. They were given half an hour to evacuate. Mm -hmm. One of five children, Bissan used to love going to school, but she hasn't been back since. She's now seeing a child psychologist. Since the war, I've been afraid to go to the shop or school, to walk with my friends, play by myself, stand at the door or play upstairs. I'm more frightened and even when people are with me, I fear the war on us will happen again. It starts at night. There are no bomb shelters in Gaza, where more than 50% of Palestinians are poor. Bissan's aunt says the children live in fear. This isn't a normal fear. They keep wetting the bed. Before the strikes, there was nothing wrong with them. They were 100% normal children. Now they make unusual movements. We can't bear to see these movements. They make me cry. Bissan's psychologist Mohammed Khatib says many children are experiencing panic, especially when they hear sounds they connect with shelling. He and his colleagues say healing is almost impossible for Gazan children because the source of fear, recurring conflict, never goes away. 
The latest bout lasted five days, and children were among the 33 Palestinians killed. After 11 days of fighting two years ago between Gaza's Hamas rulers and Israel, UNICEF officials said about half of Gaza's young people, or 500,000 children, could be in need of psychological support. We have some good news for you. On the medical front, South Korean researchers have unveiled an AI technology that can diagnose six of the most common cancers in about an hour with just a few drops of blood. Data shows that one out of three South Koreans fight some kind of cancer in their life. More so than with any other disease, the cancer survival rate is higher the earlier it is detected, which in itself is the challenge. Diagnosis is possible only when a suspected organ is thoroughly scanned and biopsied. Only very few types of cancer like prostate cancer can be diagnosed through urine or blood tests. Other cancers need more complex imaging techniques, which makes it difficult to diagnose early. But now a local research team has developed a technology where six different types of cancers can be detected with just 10 drops of blood in roughly one hour. First, the plasma separated from the blood goes through a filtering process to extract exosomes. Exosomes are microvesicles that carry a wide variety of DNA, RNA, proteins and lipids, but cancerous exosomes reflect genetic alterations in their makeup, making them new biomarkers in early cancer detection. The exosome is placed on nanochips and put in an analysis machine. As light passes through the exosomes, it is projected in a graph form. An artificial intelligence that has studied the genetic information of 600 cancer patients is able to tell if cancer is detected. The six cancers that this technology can detect are lung, breast, colon, liver, pancreatic and stomach. Its accuracy for detecting cancer is over 97 percent, and its accuracy for determining the type of cancer is over 90 percent. We're aiming for the testing fee to detect six types of cancers at once to be around 230 US dollars. The research team plans to conduct clinical trials with their latest discovery on the different types of cancers one by one, starting with lung cancer this year, and start applying for approval by 2024. Research on developing technology that only uses blood to diagnose cancer is in full swing around the world, but one that can detect multiple cancers has yet to be commercialized. The rival factions in Sudan continue to clash despite the ceasefire in the capital city of Khartoum. This comes amid fears that the fighting could break the fragile United States-Saudi Arabia-brokered week-long ceasefire deal. Clashes between rival military factions could be heard overnight in parts of Sudan's capital, residents said on Wednesday. And that's despite a week-long ceasefire designed to allow for the delivery of aid and lay the ground for a more lasting truce. Civilians must be spared and you must stop this senseless violence now. In Geneva, the UN's High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, described the situation as heartbreaking. In spite of successive ceasefires and they keep making these arrangements, we see that they get observed in their breach almost within hours after these arrangements are signed. We see how civilians continue to be exposed to serious risk of death and injury. I mean, overnight we received reports of fighter jets across Khartoum, and clashes in some areas of the city, as well as gunfire heard Khartoum North and in Om Durman. Turk also said he was deeply troubled by reports of sexual violence in Khartoum and Darfur. He called on Army Chief General Abdel Fattah al-Bahan and General Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, leader of the paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, to issue clear instructions to those under their command that there is zero tolerance for sexual violence and that perpetrators of all violations would be held accountable. The ceasefire deal, following Saudi and US-mediated talks, comes after five weeks of intense warfare. Previous truces have failed to stop the fighting, which has sent more than a million people fleeing their homes and plunged the country deep into a humanitarian crisis.
Welcome back to World News and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The first major search for Madeleine McCann in a decade is expected to be extended into a third day as Portuguese and German police continue to dig into the wooden banks of a reservoir in Algarve. Paris Saint-Germain players train to cheers from young fans in their home's Parc des Princes stadium in the French capital. Thousands of delighted children fans wore their favorite PSG jerseys and chanted their names of their idols, Kylian Mbappe, Neymar and Lionel Messi as they hoped to snag autographs after the session. Bolivia's Catholic Church admits that it could have done more to address widespread sexual abuse of children in the country's church-run schools. Since April, over 200 survivors of abuse have come forward after revelations surfaced that a Catholic priest abused dozens of minors across several decades. Uprooted trees were seen on crushed cars Video footage on social media showed after Guam weathered Super Typhoon Mauer, its most powerful storm in years. The Category 4 typhoon unleashed winds of up to 150 miles per hour and torrential rain on the Western Pacific Island. Countries from around the world gathered at the United Nations to pledge $2.4 billion in humanitarian assistance for the Horn of Africa. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called the situation a crisis on top of crises. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we leave you tonight with the fans and colleagues alike mourning and remembering the life and the unparalleled talents of the queen of rock and roll herself, Tina Turner. Stay safe and have a good night.